Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Arkham Sessions. My name is Brian Ward. With me, as always, the psychologist to the superheroes, superheroines, and supervillains of Gotham City, Dr. Andrea Letamendi. Howdy. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited for this week. Uh, why is that? Well, for one, we're doing this show. Oh, we're yeah, covering, yeah, that's something. Yeah. We're covering an episode I really like. And then second, we have WonderCon coming up this weekend. WonderCon. Dre, why don't you go ahead and tell the folks um, where you'll be primarily through WonderCon? Because you've got, what, three panels? I do. And WonderCon is one of my favorite comic conventions not just because it's nearby in Anaheim, but also because it's um, it's not as wild and crazy as uh, Comic Con, as you know, down that in San Diego. It's kind of like the younger cousin. Uh, it's of course it's grown so much over the the last couple of years, but it is one of my favorite conventions because. It is manageable. It has a great program. Um, there's also um, lots of great, um, uh, you know, I like the shopping, right? There's so, lots of good shopping. There's yeah. lots of good shopping. There's lot. The floor is amazing. And again, it's not as overwhelming as some of the larger conventions. So I'm excited. It reminds me a lot of Comic-Con. I mean, it's from the same folks that put on Comic-Con. So they certainly know what they're doing. But it reminds me a lot of Comic-Con. Uh, from years and years and years ago where everything is impressive on the floor, but the crowds haven't necessarily gotten there. Although last year the crowds were pretty intense, not nearly to Comic-Con extremes, but it's it's very clear that since uh, WonderCon moved from the San Francisco area to Anaheim, that it's certainly grown and that it appears to be growing even more um, each year. So I'll be curious to see it, but, but tell the folks where they're going to be able to find you. Sure. So I actually have a panel on Saturday evening. It's called a mad world exploring insanity in fiction. I'm really excited about this one. So for folks that don't know, what is it that you're going to be exploring in this particular panel? So we're going to be talking about the way that mental health disorders and mental health treatments are um, portrayed in the media, in particular in comic books and graphic novels, in film and TV. And of course, um, we have a number of spectacular writers who are joining us to talk about the process of um, building characters and stories to kind of represent mental health and also to, to talk about as a writer, like the struggles with um, creating accurate portrayals as well as as not kind of losing you know their own sense of of safety and wellness as they're creating really in-depth characters right so i'm super excited i'm joined by um our good friend and colleague javi who um who as you know wrote for lost and everyone should know that we're we're talking about javier grujo mark's watch yes he wrote for lost he created and wrote the middleman which your company put out on dvd um we also have Brendan Fletcher, the current writer or co-writer for Batgirl, and who has recently announced that he'll be writing for Black Canary mm -hmm. uh, with DC Comics. And Gotham Academy, one of my favorites. Yeah, great writer. Um, Jody Hauser, who is hugely successful with her Orphan Black comic by IDW. She's also done some bullying uh, stuff with Marvel's uh, No More she Bullying. Bullied, she bullies people? <laughs> she, she, She's she done some bullying know. with Marvel. She, she wrote a really great Guardians of the Galaxy story for Marvel in their, um, their anti-bullying comic uh, last year. We're also going to be joined by Margaret Scott, who is the writer of Windblade, who is the very well-known female transformer. Um, this is a fantastic story. If you haven't picked it up, it's also by IDW. And finally, Zach Stentz, who was the screenwriter for one of the X-Men films, and he's recently announced his involvement in a new film called Acme with Steve Carell. Nice. And I keep saying we, because of course, Brian, you're going to be our moderator, keeping things on track. What? <laughs> We need a moderator. We need someone to keep me from, you There are know. a lot of people on that panel. You're all going to need wrangling. And I, I look forward <laughs> to uh, to taking on that task. It's going to be a great conversation. I'm really excited about that one. I will be sure to ask you plenty of questions like who gets it right and who gets it wrong. So, uh, so oh, I, yeah. I, I highly recommend that if folks are going to be down at WonderCon, they need to come and hang out with us on Saturday night. That's at 630. Do we know right. what room? Yes. It's at 630 Saturday in room 208. Okay. 
And then come back on Sunday because I have two panels on Sunday. The first one, it's a recurring panel that I've participated in in the past. It's End Bullying, Responding to Cruelty in Our Culture. My good friends and colleagues, Carrie Goldman and Chase Masterson, who we know from Star Trek, um, have basically created this uh, this panel and this group of this coalition that's uh, essentially trying to educate people and and really foster um, support and and more understanding and empathy for people who are being bullied. And it's it's a fantastic panel. It's actually good for families, for kids, for adults who've experienced it. They always always have a good lineup of uh, panelists that are sort of giving their stories and encouragement and things like that. So I highly recommend checking that out. Yeah. So that's going to be Sunday at 1030 and 208. And then finally, Building the Modern Superheroine is um, also Sunday afternoon. And by superheroine, you mean like, uh, you know, shoot it up. No, straight to the no, no, no. We're talking about. So you're not building superheroine. No, we're talking about female superheroes and how to how to kind of create really meaningful, um, really impactful, and heroic women in in comics who are um, who are not just you know oh they they wear you know. a bedazzled bra and, and, you know, run around like some, something that's of more substance. So I'm really there just to kind of talk about the impact of inclusion and diversity and in terms of gender. And I'm essentially just kind of, uh, I'm thrilled to join this, this panel of wonderful speakers, Cecil Castellucci, Becky Cloonan, Sarah Kuhn, Babs Tarr, who of course is the artist for the current run of Batgirl, and Amy Radcliffe, who will be moderating. And Becky Cloonan, also co-writer with along with uh, Brennan Fletcher for Gotham Academy. Gotham Academy. It all so, it's all comes together. Yeah, cool. And uh, when is that again? So that will be Sunday afternoon, one o'clock in room two hundred seven. Okay. So you're going to be pretty busy and, um, you know, uh, I'll be sure to see at least one of those panels, uh, the one that I'm moderating. You better show up for that one. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm highly considering coming to that one. That's on Saturday night. And then, uh, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and re- come to the other two as well. Thank you. Um, and we, we recommend that you guys come to those panels as well. Uh, come hang out with us uh, and, and be sure to drop by and say hi to us afterward. And then, uh, you know, let's all hang out and have a good time and uh, enjoy WonderCon like we do every year. I'm so excited. I'm excited about this episode because we get an opportunity to explore one of your favorite rogues gallery members, Clayface. And uh, we'll get to discuss maybe the future of Clayface or the lack of future of Clayface. We don't know. We don't know. We'll, it's unclear at the end. It's unclear. Kind we'll, of. We're going to talk about it. Okay. Um, this episode was a mudslide. It was uh, written by Steve Perry. Not that Steve Perry. Oh, you knew I was going to ask. I may have I may have anticipated you were asking <laughs> about Steve Perry. It was written by Steve Perry, uh, based on a story by Alan Burnett and uh, directed by Eric Radomski. This one was actually uh, brought about because the first Clayface episode, uh, Feet of Clay, was actually popular enough that they got a lot of people asking about another Clayface story. So Eric Radomski actually suggested. Uh, trying to put together a, a story. Right. So for people who maybe have not seen Feet of Clay or haven't listened to that episode from the Arkham Sessions, Matt Hagen was a you know very popular, successful actor. He unfortunately um, was in an accident mm-hmm. and um, was disfigured. And so, of course, uh, couldn't act, couldn't couldn't really perform in the sense of he, he no longer looked like the dashing... Uh, the kind, of, that, the kind of guy that a name like Matt Hagen yes, suggests. Yes. Right. So he essentially, in our in our podcast, we talked about how he became addicted to this substance that he would um, put on his his face. Mm-hmm. It was called Renew You, I believe, and it it allowed him to morph into any thing, any person that uh, that he wanted to, mm-hmm. and for a while it it really was 
was uh, not a problem for him until he developed this really dangerous addiction to it and needed to have it. And, uh, and it, you know, of course, wasn't good for him. Right. And we remember that our, our old friend Roland Daggett was the man who was supplying the Renew You mm-hmm. to Matt Hagen in that episode um, and was holding it against him. And it is actually, it was his thugs who ended up pouring this stuff down his That's throat. That's right. I keep forgetting and that. And broke him down, turned him into Clayface. Yeah. So so he had already developed this this strong addiction to it. But what, what they had actually done, I mean, it was very traumatic. They held mm-hmm. him down and poured a vast amount of of this substance onto his face and created Clayface in this way. So he does have that history of, of being violated in that way. Yeah. So now we get to find out what happened to him when all of that was over. It it gives you an opportunity to sort of revisit his trauma and let's see where he is. This particular episode starts out with him going through Uh, As many Batman, the animated series episodes start out a heist. And uh, strangely enough, this one is not of a Bruce Wayne owned corporation or bio lab of of some kind. How is that even possible? It's like the one building that he doesn't own. Yeah. Uh, Well, we're going to discuss that in a little bit because uh, I did start to have questions. Looks like trouble at Tarnower Financial, Alfred. I won't be home early after all. And one of the guards notices that something is strange when he notices that there are two of the same person. He trips a silent alarm. And uh, Batman, of course, comes in from what he thinks is going to be a slow night in Gotham. And uh, rather than get to go home and eat his goose, he has to go to Tarnower Financial, find out what's going on. And he ends up taking on Clayface. Now, Clayface puts an end to the fight when he hears clock chimes and he ends up fleeing the building. And when he leaves, we notice that Clayface isn't necessarily his same fluid self. He is slowing down exponentially. He is starting to breathe uh, kind of heavily. He, he is uh, going through a lot more stress to move than he has in the past. Batman notices this as well. He actually offers, he says, um, if we remember from Feet of Clay, Batman offers to help Matt Hagen become normal again and Hagen turns him down the offer still stands I don't need your help Batman again we'll get to this in a, in a couple of minutes but when everything when the the chase comes to an end this woman in a car drives up and tells Matt to get in the back seat and and he does he gets in the back seat she drives away so there's an accomplice mm-hmm. now and we find out that this uh, accomplice's name is Stella. Now, when you put a character, a female character named Stella in an episode with an actor, things are bound to happen. But we're going to find out. We're going to find out if those things happen. <laughs> there's a, a, there's bit. a certain theme to this episode yeah that early on you start to pick up the references yeah so uh you know stella ends up taking matt back to a lab where there is a a weird device it's it's not unlike the kind of thing you may have seen in an original uh, like the universal frankenstein movies or or something along those lines it's a big sort of bed with an indention it kind of reminds me of the kinds of things you would see in the black hole or Mm -hmm. um there there are other references well frankly i mean if we're going to use the the clay face sort of uh body morphing it it reminds me the kind of thing that play-doh would have come out oh my gosh i was just thinking the same thing because it's like a little mold wait sorry it's a big mold yeah and he lies down in it and his clay just kind of like you know takes shape takes shape and then this, uh, the second piece, the top piece is lowered down and, and Steam. covers it up and, and then something is pumped through. So yeah. it's, and then when it comes out, it almost looks like, uh, like an Academy Award statue, yeah. just the way that it's just this, you know, like golden man. I, I, I don't know. I wonder if that was intentional because we're talking about movies. Uh, maybe. That's a good idea. That's uh, that's certainly something that I hadn't put together. It's it's not a figure that he wants to be in. Like this is clearly a like he comes out of it and he is 
he's in this shape and it's just, you can tell that the idea is to hold all the clay in to kind of keep it, him intact, mm -hmm. but he clearly doesn't want to be in this shape. Yeah. Yeah. And it is a very creepy looking shape. So it's, it's not quite human. You're going into the uncanny Valley, um, where it's just human enough to be creepy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and so, yeah, then she ends up pumping something into, uh, into his face, some sort of chemical and, presumably he is going to be in that position for a little while. So, you know, he is now becoming more and more dependent on whatever it is they've got going on. Drea, is this still the addiction or is this the chemical just wreaking havoc with his actual body? We're seeing a different Matt Hagen because in Feet of Clay, what we were seeing were signs of an addiction. We, we talked about the, um, the withdrawals, the need to, to take more and more, um, the dependency, you know, all these features, he certainly didn't need the renew you substance. And yet he was still you know, taking it in, in greater and greater amounts. Mm -hmm. And then of course he, he turned, you know, he was forced to become Clayface, if you will, because he was, um, the, the substance was, was poured onto him. Mm -hmm. So here it, we're seeing a, a bit of a different character. We're seeing somebody who is desperate to not fall apart mm -hmm. because if you think about it, if what, if what we're understanding is true, that he is now more Clayface than he is Matt Hagen, like his default body shape is Clayface and that body is deteriorating. It's falling apart. Mm -hmm. So he's, it's a life or death thing. He's, he's just trying to stay alive. And so, you know, you can't really fault him for, for wanting to, um, to, to save his own life and, and be dependent, if you will, on this, this strange system that, that keeps him alive. And I think another important component is the fact that this woman is keeping him alive by ensuring that he's, you know, he's receiving the, whatever is circulating into his body and, and making sure that he gets into this, this contraption and that he, uh, he has to sit in it for a certain amount of time. So clearly she is the one who's, who's ensuring that he's, he's alive. Yeah. We, we learned that, uh, through tests of the clay that was left behind of the, of the mud like substance, uh, that Batman has learned that the molecular bonding of his clay flesh is breaking down. He's falling apart. And they deduce that he must be committing the robberies in order to pay for this astronomically expensive treatment. They don't know what the treatment is exactly, but uh, in order to keep his body together, they figure it's got to be costing him a fortune. And that's why he's going around committing these crimes. And then, then there's a creepy little exchange between Bruce and Alfred where Bruce is trying to figure out the woman's involvement, the, the, the accomplice's, uh, Stella's involvement. Perhaps she enjoys mud baths. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of... That takes I, a whole new meaning. Yeah. I don't even want to know what's going on. Oh, I know in what that, that means. In that scenario. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but Stella is romanticizing this relationship she has with Matt Hagen because we then cut to her and she's watching a, an old movie of his where he is playing the, the dashing lead. Uh, it, this is obviously pre-accident. And his co-star in the film is a doctor who has, through plastic surgery, uh, fixed his face and rather than than be with his fiance, he decides he wants to be with the doctor. He loves the doctor and and they go and they kiss. And and what's interesting is Stella is just bawling at this movie. Like she is eating this thing up. So you get the impression that she is almost confused Matt for one of his characters. Mm -hmm. And it's also interesting that the Warner Brothers logo pops up at the end of it. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we now know that this Gotham City is in a universe where Warner Brothers exists. That's right. I didn't even realize that. But, you know, there have been previous episodes where, um, and I'm surprised this didn't happen in this episode, where the security guard is actually reading a yeah. Tiny Toons comic. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, they, no Tiny Toons comic in this one. No. Uh, but I... I 
Drea, I, I want to know what you're thinking about her character because she seems to be in love with someone that isn't the man that is in the room with her. And, and I don't just mean Clayface versus Matt Hagen. It's almost Matt Hagen versus whatever character he's playing. And we learn later that she was a consultant on this film. So they knew each other at that time. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, but, but we don't, we don't get the sense that they were necessarily an item until it came down to Hagen needed her help, similar to his character. Talk a little bit about her psyche at this moment. Well, I think it's really interesting that they knew each other, you know, while he made that film, we, as you mentioned later, we learned that she was the doctor who consulted for that film. And at some point he came to her for help. And so there's this interesting dynamic where she is, you know, a- again, his life uh, is in, in the balance and, and she is the one who who is responsible for his care. And of course, that sets up a relationship that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. And the level of emotionality is really telling that she's, you know, just by watching this film, she's deeply lost in it. And I wonder if she believes that Matt Hagen will return, you know, that Clayface will somehow be cured, that he will return to his original form, if you will, Matt Hagen, and that she will be, you know, the two of them will be together in the same way that, that the, the doctor and the, um, the main actor in, in the film she's watching come together at the end, you know, almost against all odds that here he is engaged to someone else in, and the character in the film nurtures this man and, and cares for him and until he's well again. And I think that she sees herself as that person. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of that is not really based in reality. I think that some part of that is, is her fantasizing. I find myself wondering two things because we don't really know enough backstory to know which of these two things might be true, but two things come to mind. The Florence Nightingale effect, uh, which is, you know, where a nurse or a, some sort of uh, caregiver, uh, you know, falls in love or, or gets, you know, some sort of sexual feelings from uh, their patients. So it makes me wonder if she has fallen in love with this man because of the situation that they're in. Or the other thing that comes to mind is maybe the, the Stockholm uh, syndrome or, or effect, you know, the, yeah. the, we don't know that he didn't come over to her because she was a consultant on this movie or whatever. We, we don't know that she didn't end up falling for him after he took right. her hostage. Well, that's a, an excellent point. We don't know a lot about their origin together and he's, I mean, he's Clayface. He essentially could have kidnapped her and could have said, you are going to bring me, you're going to figure out a way to keep me alive or you're dead. Essentially that could be the, that could have been how the relationship formed. And we see a little snippet. There's an interesting scene as the film ends where he, you know, he comes in like Frankenstein and he's in that weird, uh, Academy Award, uh, life-size man mold. And, and creepily walks in and, and discovers that she's watching that film and yells at her. Turn it off! Matthew? That's not me anymore! And I, he punches the TV. I mean, he's very violent. And it's frightening. And we see, a, we, it's like a snapshot of what their relationship might be like because, of course, she's apologetic. He raises his voice he's uh threatening he's dangerous and then shortly after he's almost the apologetic abuser you know kind of character where he's uh, he embraces her and then you get the sense like okay they are romantic it's not just her it's not just her side because he he reciprocates um but it's an interesting really volatile kind of relationship and I wonder if if he's abusive that way. And I wonder if what you're saying about her feeling kind of trapped there, if that's what the situation really is. Well, I, I'm not sure that it, that she's necessarily feeling trapped anymore 
because it's it's her place and and she's clearly got feelings for him. I find myself wondering if maybe it started out that way and then now she is uh, she's clearly developed feelings for him and uh, you know she is very uh, sympathetic for his his plight and and um I don't know there there seems to be of all the characters in this particular episode, she's the one that seems like you would want to focus on if you were going to have, a, you know, a patient in this in this mm-hmm. episode. Like if if she came across your your office, you know, or came into your office, you know, I, I feel like you would maybe have a field day with her. Yeah, I would want to know so much more about her. And unfortunately, we we don't know a lot about their history. And um, and then later in the episode, she becomes, you know, she's she's a really important part of this story. Mm -hmm. She's really interesting in the way that she, no matter what, defends Clayface and will risk her life for him. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Stella shows Matt a new development in her progress toward making him more uh, his old self. And she ends up showing him a new isotope, MP40. An experimental mutagenic adaptogen. I believe it can restore, maybe even increase your powers, perhaps permanently. You can become Matt Hagen again, forever. And uh, and she says that, uh, which I find interesting, that the only source of this MP40 isotope is in the Wayne Biomedical Labs. Once again, it's the name Wayne. I, I now realize that it, it took me until this episode. Or, or <laughs> you maybe, didn't know that Bruce Wayne was Batman? <laughs> It came as a little bit of a shock to me, but no, let's think about this for a second. I'm sure if we did a whole list of all the things, you know, this is very Troy McClure from the Simpsons. You know, if we did a list of all the places that Bruce Wayne owns in these first 53 episodes, um, we're going to find that Bruce Wayne literally has a monopoly on Gotham City. Yeah, of course. Um, And uh, I'm not so sure he should be allowed to do that. You know, that's sort of illegal. I would think about the more obvious conclusion here, which is that the the single person who could be Batman is the one with all of the resources and the technology and then the finances and, and the one person who has all those things is Bruce Wayne. And I will, uh, l- let's turn it around just a little bit. If you're a citizen of Gotham and you want to figure out who, or, or say you're Jim Gordon or, or Harvey Bullock, and you want to figure out who Batman is, who is the one person in Gotham City who stands to lose the most? Because if any building in Gotham City is, is knocked off or is uh, you know robbed or burglarized or blown up, but odds are Bruce Wayne is the one who's losing that building. Right. So uh, it, if nothing else, Bruce has become Batman just to protect his property. Sure. And it could be that every single citizen of Gotham City, including every member of the Gotham City Police Department, knows that Bruce Wayne is Batman, but because he's suffered such tragedy and, you know, because <laughs> this is the this. only Come way on, yeah. that he can really survive, they're just kind of letting him do his thing. I like the idea that maybe even crime isn't really crime in Gotham no. City. It's just, uh, it's like, let's just give, let's give Bruce Wayne somebody to beat up on. <laughs> you drew the short straw, so you're the super villain tonight. This is becoming an entirely different episode. But, um, you know, so they end up going to Wayne Biomedical Labs in order to to steal this MP40. Now, now this is where I think it, it becomes really amusing because earlier on in the episode, we hear Batman say, hey, I offered you help. That offer still stands. Mm-hmm. And now Clayface is going after the one isotope right. that can help him, <laughs> and it's in Wayne... Look, he wants it on his terms. Oh, okay. (laughs) If only he'd been like, okay, Batman, could you help me? I think everything would have worked out. But no, he ends up breaking into Wayne Biomedical. And uh, and what's what's interesting is that uh, after he steals the isotope, uh, Batman 
isn't fooled. Like Batman is on it. Batman knows exactly which person is Clayface. It's the female doctor who slips out through the front door and, uh, and Batman jumps onto the train to, to follow her. Now in this train, there's a very traumatizing moment. And what's interesting is they, they introduce a child into the scene. The child is watching this uh, woman, this doctor in a lab coat melting in yeah. front of their eyes and saying, mommy, mommy, the woman is melting. And, and it's kind of terrifying. It is. And this is, uh, this is one of the reasons why I like episodes like this and why I like characters like Clayface, um, you know, and Killer Croc and, and sort of the more monsters, uh, monster type of villains, if you will, in that you have um, scenes like this where you see him he's realizing that he's melting and, and the, the figure who is the, you know, he's disguised as, the, as this woman, as she starts to melt, it's a, it's kind of a slower, gradual process. And then he kind of just, uh, sets his head against, mm -hmm. against the, the window of the train. And, and that I think is the most, it's a grotesque scene in animation in, in the sense that like this figure is, is just, you know, melting away. Um, but it's also deeply sad. It's like he, he's given up. He's like, okay, this is going to happen. And there are these onlookers on this train just watching this happen and they're helpless and, and they're they, yeah. terrified. They get terrified and they run away. And then he says, that's it. Run, run for your measly lives. Run from Clayface. Like, it, yeah. this is something that he is used to. And, uh, you, you get the sense that, on one hand, he's hurt by it, but on the other hand, he his rage is almost fueled by it. Right. And this is somebody, remember, who did not want to be a villain. He didn't want to be a bad person. He doesn't want to steal things. He's doing it to keep himself alive and, and to be safe. And, you know, I'm, I always go back to what are what are the person's basic needs? And he was an actor to begin with. So his needs involve not just being alive and, and making sure his body's intact, but also um, being loved and adored and being watched and and people being entertained by him. Mm -hmm. So this scene is the antithesis of that. Mm -hmm. It's it's incredibly, you know, as I said, all these things, it's grotesque, it's sad. Um, and it's also, you know, it, we see the anger that comes out of him. So uh, I, I like that scene. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the trauma that, that those people on the train no are, way. are going to feel. <laughs> like uh, if you see someone on the train just melt in front of you. It is scary. That, again, this is one of the more frightening scenes in the animated series. Is that child going to become super villain Tot later? That, that child is traumatized. It is like... Although, as you pointed out, children are much more resilient than we uh, than than we think. So, so maybe one of the... The mother is going to become a super villain uh, in Gotham City. Every single person on that train is going to become a super villain <laughs> after watching that horrific thing that's, go down. That's possible. Batman uh, steps in, of course, and attacks. He ends up uh, freezing Clayface with uh, a, a convenient spray that he has it's not on convenient he planned to he knew that he had to bring that it is true he did he did know but it did remind me of something like straight out of like batman 66 where it's like oh now i've got i've got this spray that will totally freeze you and uh, it does it neutralizes clayface to some degree clayface ends up uh you know falling out of the train you know going through the window and and you know falling uh down into a ravine or something batman keeps going and it's like oh i could have stopped it and didn't and uh you know batman ends up tracking clayface down um but ends up doing it because alfred makes a reference to you know alfred's been sitting there in the in the the bad cave trying to to figure out any connection that clayface might have had or matt hagan would have had with any of his many starlets uh you know and he had this very uh almost jfk-ish sort of uh, personality and and reputation for constantly being with the beautiful women and uh, none of them seemed to be intelligent enough to be doctors that could help him. So this was, this was uh, something that Alfred was stumbling on until he makes this comment. We're missing something. I can't imagine what. Closest thing Hagen had to a relationship with a doctor was in the film Dark Interlude. 
and Batman instantly knows who to go for. Uh, he ends up going through some logs and discovers that, oh, really? Dr. Bates, Stella Bates, Dr. Stella Bates once owned a motel and then sold it <laughs> and, uh, and ended up buying this property, this, this lab, this hideout that they now have. Uh, she was the consultant, as we said, she was the consultant on the film. Right. That's how, that's how Matt Hagen knew her. Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, I'll bring it up again. She owned a motel. Ugh. And, uh, and then ended up, you know, spending the money on this property. And I don't know what kids watching would have gotten. Like, do you think that that was that some of these things are written in to oh, yeah. kind of entertain adults? Adults, oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. But but this episode in itself it has this episode is quite full of uh, almost pun like coincidences to you know cinema. Um, but, um, but, but it's done in a fun way. So, yeah. uh, but, but we're not done yet because mm -hmm. again, if you're going to have an actor and then a female character named Stella in, uh, in your episode, naturally little thing has to happen. And that is that Stella tries to stop Batman from wrecking the place. She runs after him, uh, Batman sidesteps, she ends up breaking some stuff, falling down, and, uh, and Matt Hagen yells, Stella! Stella! Yeah. That, that <laughs> Again, now I know as a kid I would not have gotten that reference, so it's, you know, that's for, that's a... It's totally for older folk. Yeah. And uh, Clayface ends up, and, and this is actually, uh, this is one of Clayface's almost got a moments. Clayface envelops Batman into his body and, and basically tries to suffocate him inside yeah. the clay. I mean, you can see Batman trying to get out. He's trying to break free. You see his face actually emerging from Clayface's chest and Clayface just shoves him right back in and, and says... I can feel his heart slowing. And, it's, and I think this is, again, another great... It, when, when you're going to be working with Clayface, these are the things we want to see. These yeah. are the scenes that we love. And again, it's grotesque. It's, it's kind of horrific. You see the, you know, the outline of, of the arms and, and Batman's face trying to come out. And he's essentially being suffocated inside of Clayface's body. And it's, uh, I, I think it's, it's great. I, Although, mean, I mean, it's terrible, but it's great. Right. But there was one moment that when Clayface says, I can feel his heartbeat getting slower, you could say he's dying or you could say Batman's calming down. Like, like yeah. Batman's no longer fighting. He's now resuming control. He's gearing up to do something. Because right at this moment, as, as Clayface begins to laugh, suddenly in another terrifying moment, Clayface's head explodes from the inside. I mean, like yeah. suddenly the grappling hook comes out and Batman escapes using his grappling hook and, and he, he's coming straight out of Clayface's head. It's, it's, yeah, it's gross. Yeah. It's, it's not a pleasant sight. Um, but it is very cool. And, uh, and so they end up uh, fighting once again. Now Clayface decides he's just going to put an end to things once and for all. And he takes the, the, the fight outside into the rain. Matthew, get back inside! You're absorbing the rain! And, uh, and so he basically says, no, this is, this is going to end right here and now. And he takes Batman almost in a Reichenbach Falls, Sherlock Holmes, Moriarty kind of way, like takes him straight off the cliff and the two uh, are, are plummeting. Batman naturally uses his grappling hook to to save him and uh, he is holding on to Clayface in a very heroic like I can still help you mm -hmm. the problem is Clayface's body is breaking apart so rapidly that he can't keep a grasp and Clayface ends up falling uh, presumably to his demise he hits the ocean and we see again in a very traumatizing sort of uh, sort of moment he just sort of 
um, he, he dissolves he into the water. dissipates across yeah. the water. And uh, it, it is beautifully done. It's tragic. But, um, you know, it's, it is the last time we see Matt Hagen or Clayface in Batman the Animated Series. Mm-hmm. So is he dead? Is he gone for good? We don't know. Or maybe we do. Maybe we'll talk about it when we're doing another show. We'll find out. Man, this got real, real sad. <laughs> yeah. But Drea, talk about, talk about that now. She has just looked, watched this man that she's in love with and has been trying to help, has been trying to nurse back to health and, and back to being his old Matt Hagen self. And he just plummeted to his death in right. the ocean. Um, what is she going through? Well, something that I noticed is that when when Clayface was trying to kill Batman by, um, you know, through suffocation in, in Clayface's own body, Stella was telling him to stop. She was yeah. saying that he shouldn't do that. And, you know, I, I think that you were, were seeing a woman who, you know, while she would sacrifice everything for this man, she's not... A murderer. She's not someone who... She's not Harley Quinn. No, no, she certainly isn't. She's she's someone who um, wanted to help him and probably saw herself as a caregiver and as a partner and as, as someone who, um, who could be effective in that way. Mm-hmm. And again, I go back to asking, like, what are her basic needs? And her basic needs involve having that role of caring for somebody and having that person, you know, care about her, um, to reciprocate that. And so, you know, obviously when he dies, she's, she's just horrified and, and she's, she's probably going to be, um, you know, just destroyed by it. She's going to be distraught after this. And I, I also kind of think about Batman's reaction as well, that, he was attempting to help, you know, he certainly doesn't want to kill him either. So he was attempting to help him. Mm -hmm. And, and there's something interesting that there may have been a chance that he could have survived, but he, you know, he had this last line. Curtains going down. Hagen! Almost as if he, almost as if Clayface acknowledges, there's no point of me surviving. Like I'm already dead. So I, I think that he knew it and I'm not sure that anyone else had lost hope in him. I think he lost hope in himself, but I think both Batman and Stella were hopeful that, that he could have returned to being Matt Hagen. I am really too expensive to animate. So no. I move on. That's gotta no. be, that's gotta be why it's gotta be why he doesn't show no, up again. I don't. He's so much fun. He is a lot of fun, but when you think about it from an animator's perspective, you think about these are hand-drawn cells and every little movement of yeah, clay it can't and be, every little can't be shaky. you know, every little line that's flowing and oozing off of him, that's got to be a really expensive uh, episode to, to to try to produce. So, um, you know, I I don't know. I I I do find myself wondering maybe what you do with someone like Stella, because uh, clearly she's got to be a bit of an accomplice. She's going to go to prison or, you know, she's certainly going to go to therapy for this. Uh, What do you do for a woman like that uh, who is uh, has just lost this monster of of a character that she was in love with? Literally. Yeah. Well. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about you saying she would either go to prison or go to therapy as if one no, well, is a... No, no, I'm, I'm saying she, she would probably go to prison for being an accomplice, but she's certainly going to need, you know, they're, they're going to say you need to go to counseling because, you know, the, the person she was in love with, who was a mud monster, just went to his death. You know, they're, they're going to want her to be counseled, right? Who's they? The justice system. You don't There's think, no justice you don't, you, system you, 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 you in Gotham City. Who puts them in into Blackgate or or whatever they they're having in this animated series? Like, who puts them in Stonegate and Arkham? 
the justice system. Clearly, clearly, yeah. she's well, going actually, to go through counseling. Actually, we have had instances where at the end of the episode, the you know the villain or the accomplice doesn't doesn't go to Arkham; that they go somewhere else, or that there's some. Uh, I think we saw in Pretty Poison. It was Stonegate uh, and uh, Man Bat. And Man Bat, I think is... Man Bat also was able to avoid um, going to Arkham Asylum. And certainly, Stella isn't going to Arkham Asylum, but. Right. I, I and I'm not even sure, you know, given the circumstances, they may have attributed everything she did to kind of being trapped with him or being manipulated or even um held hostage by him. Classic defense. I that's where I would not go. My fault. Not that's my fault. where I would go with her. I mean and and I think that could be partially true. She could have been in some way scared of him. Mm-hmm. Um because as we saw, he he did have a temper and he was very threatening and he was violent. She loved him. I, I have no doubts that she loved him. Yeah. Well, I thought it was a pretty cool episode. Uh, and I, it's one of those characters that I'm sad to see go because I would like to see what happens from this, this point forward. I know. I'm... For all we know, he's not dead. For all we know, he is hanging out in Gotham City, uh, somehow a, a fully formed man thing that you know we never see his clay persona oh, like the the uh something in the salt water could have um combined with some compound in the clay and that has yeah. cured him and he's walking around as sherwood yeah oh yeah he could totally <laughs> be sherwood uh yeah maybe yeah what do you think what do you think of this episode I like, I, this is one of my favorite. They're all my favorite, but uh, again, I, I like, I like when there's a story to it. It's not just a villain committing crimes and, you know, doing terrible things because they like doing terrible things. Mm-hmm. He had justification for committing the crimes that he did. And it goes back to, um, you know, his, his wanting to save his own life. It goes back to the relationship that he had with somebody who cared about him. You know, you have a really, you have a rich story here. Yeah. So dating back in, uh, in February, we got an email over at Arkham sessions at gmail.com from a, a listener named Josh. And I think now is the perfect time to, to ask that question and, and get an answer from you. And, uh, that is that, uh, he says, I was wondering if actors get any disorders or fatigue from getting lost in their roles, playing too many characters, or losing themselves. This must be especially hard for Clayface since he has to physically become people. What are your thoughts? Hmm. Well, you know, you have more experience in in the industry, if you will. I have not come across any clay <laughs> creatures. Um, it, I don't, well, certainly I'm not qualified to say if there are any disorders uh, or anything like that, but I will say that there are actors who are notorious for diving too deeply into their roles mm-hmm. or, or inhabiting a character from beginning in, uh, to end of a, of a project. And sometimes uh, this works out in their favor. Sometimes uh, it just really makes them jerks and, you know, whatever. There, there's actually a really famous story about, uh, and I don't know how true it is, um, but, but there's a famous story about Dustin Hoffman uh, working with Sir Lawrence Olivier on uh, Marathon Man uh, back in the day. And uh, if, if you've been an actor uh, in, in an acting class, I, I'm sure you've heard this story, but Dustin is the type of person who will get into the role and start sort of inhabiting that role. And uh, in a particular scene with, uh, with Olivier, um, he has to basically be just torn down and tortured. And as, uh, you know, to, to prepare for this moment, uh, Dustin Hoffman actually stayed up for three nights oh my gosh. and, and, you know, really sort of took it seriously. He's, he is a method actor for sure. And, uh, when he ended up coming to the set, um, you know, you've got Lawrence Olivier, who is considered the greatest actor of his generation asking Dustin Hoffman, like, what's the deal? Why, why do you look so tired? And, 
you know, Hoffman ends up telling him that, you know, he stayed up for, for three days and, and, uh, Olivier basically, um, the way that it was told to me is that Olivier basically gives a, a long pause and then, um, and then simply says, uh, you know, try acting, dear boy. It's much easier. <laughs> Suggesting that look, we're we're playing pretend, right? Here, you know, and, right. and I am the greatest actor of my generation, but I don't. You won't see me staying up for three nights to pretend like gonna, I was tortured. How are you going to remember lines if you're sleep deprived? Well, and, and it's one of those situations where uh, you've got a guy who uh, wanted to learn from the best and and thought he was he was getting into the role and then only to find out that this guy is like you're insane um no you would say that he's not actually insane there's no. you know but <laughs> uh but a lot of people would say that maybe Dustin Hoffman at that time now that was in his youth I don't I don't know that he would necessarily do that today at his age mm -hmm. and it is fair to say that Lawrence Olivier was in the twilight of his life uh, at the time of this movie. So maybe he would have done it when he was younger, but certainly not now. And uh, there are actors who are like that, uh, people who have gained reputations for, depending on their roles, um, being the kinds of people you don't want to be around. Jake Gyllenhaal today has a reputation like that, like for, uh, for the movie that he did, um, Night... Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler, uh, he, he's got a really bad reputation for sort of really being as creepy as he was mm -hmm. on that, on that, that movie. he really wanted to get into that role. So he kind of lost himself, if you will, yeah. started to act and behave the same way, started to speak the same way. Um, you know, I have a couple, a couple things that I'm thinking about now that you're mentioning that one is that, um, there are, there are certainly our actors. I mean, our, our Batman, our Dark Knight, Christian Bale mm -hmm. in, uh, what was the film where he lost, you know, the machinist. Yeah. He lost so much weight. Um, and I like that this, this person asked a question about Clayface's um, kind of physical transformations and how that must be, mm -hmm. that must add fatigue to his, you know, his job. And I think that that's a great kind of, um, that's a great example or I guess metaphor. Cause obviously Clayface is it, it, we're now in, in kind of a supernatural kind of example of that, but mm -hmm. there are actors that go through a lot of um, tests of endurance and, you know, physical challenges and also well, again, you've got Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, Jake who, Gyllenhaal. Who went from super skinny in uh, nightcrawler to uh, then became absolutely just bought like gained 40 additional pounds or something right. like that in order uh, to do his his new uh his new boxing movie so right so um, it's it's kind of interesting how clay faces transformation physically from one role to the next is kind of um in a way representing um how real actors are moving from from one role to another and, and physically changing and emotionally changing and yeah. i think that you know What's that do to you mentally, though? I mean, yeah, not just well, the physical, but but the, you know, bouncing from because I, I know a lot of actors. I know that, you know, a lot of actors uh, and, and it seems like the more you do, the more successful you are. You'll notice that the most actors, when they go on, say, The Tonight Show or something, they're not necessarily entertaining people. Al Pacino is not an entertaining person. But Unless they're doing a, a bit role. or they're acting in some way. Right, right. But they're they're generally pretty subdued. They, yeah. they almost don't have personalities. Well, there's this theory, you know, I think we may have talked about this before, that artists and actors and creative people, if you will, are more prone to or, or may have a disposition or a predisposition, I should say, to mental health problems mm -hmm. like depression and bipolar disorder and um suicidal ideation and you know we can probably name off a number of of amazingly talented creators like um robin williams like van gogh um you know where we might be able to make that association like wow many of the many of the hugely talented people in our history have demons are haunted by, um, you know, severe mental illness, 
um, tragedy, trauma, that there, you know, there seems to be this golden thread Mm -hmm. among them. And I, I, I don't know that that's necessarily been found to be true. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that when you look at the rates of mental health disorders and problems among creative people, it's not necessarily higher than folks who like me, (laughs) who aren't necessarily creative, right? Like not that I'm not creative, but, um, people in other fields like, um, health and human services or other types of fields. So that the reason we think there's that association or there's that, um, there's that link between being an actor and, and having, um, you know, mental health problems or personality disorders is that they're the ones in the spotlight. So they're the ones that we end up seeing, unfortunately, um, have those problems or go into rehab or go into treatment or attempt suicide. Um, but the truth is that those conditions and problems and challenges are common among everybody, not just creative folks. So I think that there's this kind of bias that, that we tend to see them just, we, we tend to think that they struggle more. Um, and the other thing that, that we have to remember is that, uh, correlation does not mean causation. So simply because there could be this high rate of mental health problems among actors, let's say, it could be that what drew them into the art or the field, um, is something that, that they're already dealing with, Mm -hmm. like, um, a trauma they're trying to forget or, um, interpersonal and family relationships that are, you know, really, um, unhealthy. And so they go into acting to act out and experience different relationships that they find more fulfilling or healthy. So, it's not that being an actor, like being in the field is causing these problems. It could be that what's drawing them to the field is, um, you know, is already, we would say like an existing problem. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good answer. We also have another email from uh, our good friend, Bernardo Shea, who asks uh, a couple of questions, but the one that sticks out in my mind uh, that I really like is, um, Uh, What's interesting is that when Stella is using the isotope to cure Clayface, Batman arrives, stops the machine, and insists that he has a better way of curing Clayface. Uh, Why does Batman always think he's right? (laughs) Do we add narcissism to his list of traits? Could he actually have narcissistic personality disorder? Or does she not meet enough of the, or or does he not meet enough of the symptoms? Um, now, I would say that we've discussed a little bit of narcissism already uh, in the show, and I, I remember, um, I remember there was the one episode where he refuses to tell Jim Gordon the answer to certain <laughs> riddles, where it's right. like he's not going up against the Riddler; he's going up against the, uh, uh, you know, the guy whose whose job it is to take his his in the Cape and Cow conspiracy. Oh, right. Uh, right. And and Gordon is like, oh, do you know the answer to that? And Batman's like, don't you? You know, so it, it's he he does almost always have to be the smartest one in the room. Now this is the MP40 isotope was created at his own lab, so you would think he would he could want totally to, he could take credit yeah, for it. He would want to endorse that. He'd be like, you know what? No, it's actually true. This is the best possible thing. It's it's weird that he didn't allow them to use it. You know, like what if this could actually be a cure? Yeah, he was so keen on like on actually helping Clayface. Like this may have been it. Why not believe this female doctor? Like, does he question her because mm. she's incompetent in well, his eyes? Okay, but now here's a question that I had when watching the episode: Is she a uh, a wine a Wayne? Is she a wino? <laughs> Is she a Wayne biomedical lab technician in, in some way? If this is the only place you can get the MP40 isotope, where did she get it? She had to have gotten it from right. work, maybe. We don't know. Maybe maybe she brought it home from the office. Maybe he knows exactly who she is, and he's like, no, trust me, she is not a good doctor. <laughs> I don't know. Have you checked her HR records? Yeah. Um, she's made some errors. I can't tell you how I know, but I will say she is going to be fired soon. Uh, yeah. I mean, it does, it is an interesting question. Now, now she does say that, uh, that the isotope will restore his 
his powers and maybe even make them stronger. So maybe that's something Batman does take into account. Maybe he's like, I don't want Clayface to be stronger than he yeah. is, more powerful than he is. But yeah, it could be that he didn't know the extent of, you know, the this compound, you know, what, what, what it would actually do. Maybe he doesn't even know that MP40 is his. Like maybe, maybe it's one of those things that they haven't introduced to Bruce Wayne yet. Well, it could be experimental and in in a way he doesn't want to, um, inject that in, in Clayface before it's been through all the necessary testing and it's not been approved by the IRB yet. So (laughs) or the FDA or any of the other things that you put isotopes through. Right. Yeah, I don't know. But I would say that that it is interesting that Batman instantly is like, uh, no, that's not going to do it. We should totally go back to the Batcave and figure it out there. Um, He wants to figure it out. Maybe he's like, I want to discover. That's the thing. Yeah, he always wants to be the one that fixes it. Uh, and, And as a result, how many people have to be robbed between now and then, Batman? Well, to answer Bernard's question... I don't know if this is enough information to, um, you know, to say yes, that Batman's meeting all the criteria for. But is 53 episodes enough information? No, it's not. Okay. okay. It's not. So 53 individual sessions with Batman and you have not yet. We'll go ahead and say 52 because there was the episode where Batman's basically not in it. So we'll, we'll knock that one out. But 50, 50, 52 episodes of, of Batman... There's a lot of ego going on there. I'm not denying. Of course, there's a lot of ego. Of course, he does want to be the smartest one in the room. Yes, he wants to He wants to problem solve. His favorite thing is to problem solve and to be the one to figure out the solution. Um, so that could play a part in this as well. But no, we don't have enough information to know if he has narcissistic personality disorder. It, it could just be that that he's super smart and he knows it. Mm. Come back next week for a more <laughs> in-depth answer because we're I'm sure there are going to be moments next week where he's sitting there uh, insisting on being the guy who solves whatever uh, mystery is is put in front of him. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, those are the questions for the week. Come back next week. We're going to check out paging the crime doctor, Ooh, which might be. Dr. Stella Bates. We're not, <laughs> we're not entirely sure, but, uh, but that should be a pretty good episode. Again, uh, definitely be sure to come down to WonderCon and, and come find us. Say hi. We love to meet you guys. So, uh, so yeah, that's a, a Saturday panel at 630 and then two Sunday panels. And uh, yeah, you can go look up uh, the WonderCon schedule and find Andrea Letamendi and Yes, and it's on my website, underthemaskonline.com. Oh, there's that as well. So, Dre, where can folks find you online? I am Arkham Asylum Doc on Twitter. And as I mentioned, my website is underthemaskonline.com. And you can find me. I am at bward028. You can always email both of us at arkhamsessions at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter. We are uh, at Arkham Sessions. So, until next week with Paging the Crime Doctor. I'm Brian Ward. I'm Dr. Andrea Letamendi. And we are... The Arkham Sessions.